Computing in the early 70s was a classic day of the mainframes, really. And at the time, our mainframe was from a British company. It was called ICL, International Computers Limited. You know, it was our patriotic duty in the UK to use ICL computers. Many places wanted to have an IBM computer, but they were more expensive, they were American, there were import restrictions. And within the universities in the UK, I think only two or three were allowed to have IBMs. I know uh, Cambridge was one, Newcastle was another. The problem with all of this is computers are expensive. We, the university, can only afford one. You will have to share it among yourselves. And there's quite a culture clash, even in those days. The engineers, civil engineers, whatever, structural engineers wanted to do their calculations. Physicists, chemists wanted to do their calculations. Biologists, and as we know, even people from the arts faculty wanting to run music synthesis programs. We all had to share. There certainly wasn't networks and ethernet across the campus, no. If you were lucky, what you got was what we used to call a dumb terminal. These things were just a screen and a keyboard. There's no embedded processor in the screen, no secret computer. Microcomputers had not been invented. You had a lump of cable coming out of the back of this thing, probably going through your building somehow or another, and ending up down in the traditional deep basement somewhere, leading into a shared mainframe. And what happened with mainframes was you either arrived with a deck of cards or a paper tape, and you ran what's called a batch job. You could hand over your job, and a bit later on in the day, back would come your line printer paper with the results on. Or if you were one of the favoured few, you could use one of these dumb terminals, glass teletypes they were sometimes called, and you were in the elite. You were allowed to be an interactive user, and under very carefully controlled conditions, you could submit your programs to this system. If there was a lot of output, you were encouraged to get it off a line printer. If there was a little bit, you could get it back on your glass teletype. But it was not sophisticated. It really was not. And these mainframes were going bananas, trying to share themselves equally among, shall we say, 20 or 30 simultaneous users. By today's standards, they were hopelessly underpowered. So the response was not good. That's the sort of disk. This is, we've looked it up. It doesn't say on the lettering what it is. We've looked up what a Nashua 4464 capacity is. It's 80 megabytes. And let me say again, 80 megabytes, not 80 gigabytes. And it's in this huge package. The platters in here have got the magnetic media on there that stores your ones and your zeros, but it's not sealed in a package where no dust can get in. Oh no, you put this down into a thing that looks like a top-loading washing machine in a laundrette. Oh, blind. Oh, good Lord, yeah, I remember now. You put that down, do you know, I have to ask Steve about this, it might well be that you need a special sort of spindle coming up in order to release the platters. I think you do. So I can get the bottom cover off and put it into my top loader washing machine, but I can't at the moment figure out how to get the lid off. And when you look at the side here, there's what? One, two, three, four, uh, five 16s or 80. Yeah, there'll be roughly 16 megabytes per platter. Many people were longing to be able to get a computer of their own that was powerful enough to do what they wanted to do. Of course, computer scientists felt this keenly because in many ways we ended up being the real bad sheep in the family because not so much I think that we wanted to run computationally intensive things. We, we didn't tend to want to do massive molecular orbital calculations or whatever. That could be done overnight. The thing where, which made computer scientists resented by the other lot, which is the computer service providers. And at some stage we can get into how these two split apart, and the answer is there was a lot of bloodletting, but eventually they did. But as far as the computer center, the computer service was concerned, their erstwhile colleagues in computer science were a complete pain. 
They wanted to run non-standard software in non-standard ways. This non-standard software might crash the machine. And where would that leave the rest of the time-sharing users with a dead machine? All this kind of stuff. So purely personally, my career as a computer scientist, the teaching was fine. We could teach the students early languages that we liked. Fortran, Algol were the first two. Later on, a version of Algol called Algol 68. Teaching programming was no problem. We got a share for the students. And they were doing safe things in a safe environment. But for those who wanted to do more dangerous things in the research front, yes, you had to speak very nicely to the director of the computing center and explain that you wanted to run a particular version of the Algol 68 language that you got from some colleagues and it was non-standard and it was trying to do real-time programming with Algol 68 and oh you know will this affect the rest of the users what happens if it goes wrong wouldn't it be better to run it overnight eventually I think a lot of these problems were sorted out but it became very clear that as far as computer scientists were concerned you'd love to have a machine that was all your own, even if it was less powerful a little bit than the mainframe. And as the 70s wore on, this gradually became possible. And it became possible by what's often called the second generation. After the mainframes came the mini computers. And there's some very famous names, most of which have now been absorbed or gone under. Data General, DEC was very famous, made PDB-11 mini computers and VAX mini computers. So from my point of view, towards the end of the late 70s, we managed to save up enough money in the computing section of the maths department to buy ourselves, wait for it, a PDP-1105 mini computer. It's got a small amount of memory, which is capable of taking in simple assembly level programs on paper tape, and they worked. Many viewers of this will probably know about programming languages, you know, like Java, C, C++ and so on. But of course, at a level below that, there is programming that is much closer to the hardware. And you really did have to understand about the innards of the machine to use it effectively. It's still with us, is Assembler. But nowadays, higher level languages have got sufficiently much more efficient that assembler isn't quite as important as it used to be. So anyway, there we were. We could run assembler programs with our students for the first time. And it was, it was a good step forward. But gradually, we began to hear on the computer scientist grapevine towards the end of the 70s that if only you could afford a slightly bigger PDP-11, I think it was a PDP-1134 was the minimum, there was this most amazing operating system written by computer scientists for computer scientists at Bell Laboratories in the United States and it was called Unix and it did everything just right and whereas a lot of us had struggled with the mechanisms on other operating systems for doing multitasking, multi-programming, multi-access generally, Unix was essentially written by one astonishingly gifted programmer called Ken Thompson. You got one man's computer science view of the universe about how it should be done. And for the great majority of computer scientists, it just made your jaw drop open. You thought, that is so clean. That is so good. A very large number of computer science departments, as soon as they could, went and got themselves a minimal machine, a PDP-11, with a 50 or 80 megabyte disk, wait for it, maybe 64 or 128K of memory. And for those out there who think I've made a mistake, no, kilobytes, not megabytes, and certainly not gigabytes. And in that small amount of memory, the kernel of the operating system had to run, plus your program, and there was just sufficient amount of disk that so long as you didn't have more than five or six users, on an underpowered machine. It was still slow, but it could swap between you, park bits of your program out on disk when it ran out of memory space, and generally be a good, clean, multi-user, multitasking system. Underpowered sometimes, absolutely. 
But it just changed everything. It was one of those seminal moments for computer scientists where they thought, this is just great. And I think it was not only the operating system itself, because as many people know, the, the two big names in Unix are Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, and they were given the Turing Award for inventing Unix and for inventing the C programming language. And although they shared the effort, I think to a first approximation, you could say that Unix was Ken Thompson's creation, but the C compiler getting that working, refining it was very definitely Dennis Rich's invention. Being implemented by a limited number of people who know what they are doing is far, far better than having an army of programmers. <laughs> However, that being said, you've got to be simpatico with the two people who did it. If they think the same way as you do, and their aim is the same as yours, you'll love it. But if that's not the case, you may well end up hating it. So that was how eventually we ended up with our more powerful PDP-11 in our basement, in the mass building, still air conditioned. And when we ran out of steam on that, we started thinking, oh, if only we could afford a more powerful PDP-11, more memory, bigger disk, and all this. I have actually got a photograph taken in the early 1980s of our PDP-1170. This was a more powerful PDP-11. It needed a three-phase electric supply. It ran up electricity bills like there was no tomorrow. The person you see at the bottom of the picture, the back view, I had more hair then, that is me, and there's all my grad students around, not posed, of course, not in any way, either using VDU terminals, or in the case of Neil over there, I persuaded him to look as though he was putting a dump tape onto the magnetic tape deck so that we would take a dump of the disk. There was none of this disk-to-disk -disk dumping onto terabyte backup disks that we have today. Your main disk was precious. You probably couldn't afford lots and lots of them. So the dump of what had changed during the day was done to magnetic tapes. And those of you with eagle eyes will see behind me on my bookshelf a couple of nine track magnetic tapes containing, I think, the source code of Sun Microsystems version of Unix. Well, we used to use blank tapes of that sort for dumping, and that would be done every night and a big dump at the end of every week. But you knew the dump cycle was happening. You just hoped that if the disk crashed, you could recover from the tape dump. Unix changed the world. It changed the world initially, to be fair, for computer scientists. It did also change the world for everybody else, but it took some time. Because of the licensing conditions from Bell Laboratories, who first issued it, and some more licensing conditions from University of Berkeley, who refined it a bit more. If you wanted to set up a commercial Unix operation, you needed a team of lawyers to negotiate what you could and couldn't do with Bell and Berkeley source code. And um, of course, the big computer manufacturers didn't mind this too much. But in the end, you felt, well, if, if Unix or its derivatives is going to rule the world and achieve its full potential, you've got to find somebody who can re-implement the whole thing under an open source or freely accessible type license where people are not going to be hampered by endless restrictions on what they can do, what apps they can write and so on. That overall I would say took a bit more than 10 years. I seem to remember that some of the if you like, test open source type things. I think there was a guy called Andy Tannenbaum in Holland, did Minix. And then around about that time, the well-known name again, Linus Torvalds out in Finland, really got hold of this idea that to make Unix-like systems go mainstream, you had to have a standardized heart of the operating system called the kernel. And you had to re-implement the whole thing in such a way that people could set up their own companies and under very clear conditions know what they could do and what they couldn't do. And the rest, as they say, is history. I just do not know, but it's a very large number, what percentage of the world's servers now run on Unix or Unix-derived systems nowadays, various flavors of Linux. It's enormous.
The system of vacuums inside tries and zeros, to keep it dust free, which have been recorded and tries on the therefore tape. to keep your disc and free from getting errors on it. it stores and off one this, one frequency with care, and with some memory, on your minimal PDP-11, you could probably run a little Unix system to keep right, so six I'll stop that and I'll have to rewind happy. it again now.